My Side of the Mountain, Chapter 13, The Autumn Provides Food and Loneliness. September blazed a trail into the mountains. First, she burned the grasses. The grasses seeded and were harvested by the mice and the winds. Then she sent the squirrels and chipmunks running boldly through the forest, collecting and hiding nuts. Then she frosted the aspen leaves and left them sunshine yellow. Then she gathered the birds together in flocks, and the mountain top was full of songs and twitterings and flashing wings. The birds were ready to move to the south. And I, Sam Gribbley, felt just wonderful. Just wonderful. I pushed the raft down the stream and gathered arrow leaf bulbs, cattail tubers, bulrush roots, and the nut-like tubers of the sedges. And then the crop of crickets appeared, and Frightful hopped all over the meadow, snagging them in her great talons and eating them. I tried them, because I had heard that they are good. I think it was another species of cricket that was meant. I think the field cricket would taste excellent if you were starving. I was not starving, so I preferred to listen to them. I abandoned the crickets and went back to the goodness of the earth. I smoked fish and rabbit, dug wild onions by the pouchful, and raced September for her crop. October 15th. Today the barren weasel looked moldy. I couldn't get near enough to see what was the matter with him, but it occurs to me that he might be changing his summer fur for his white winter mantle. If he is, it is an itchy process. He scratches a lot. Seeing the Baron changing his mantle for winter awoke the first fears in me. I wrote that note on a little birch bark, curled up on my bed, and shivered. The snow and the cold and the long lifeless months are ahead, I thought. The wind was blowing hard and cool across the mountain. I lit my candle, took out the rabbit and squirrel hides I had been saving, and began rubbing and kneading them to softness. The Baron was getting a new suit for winter. I must have one too. Some fur underwear, some mittens, fur-lined socks. Frightful, who was sitting on the footpost of the bed, yawned, fluffed, and thrust her head into the slate gray feathers of her back. She slept. I worked for several hours. I must say here that I was beginning to wonder if I should not go home for the winter and come back again in the spring. Everything in the forest was getting prepared for the harsh months. Jesse Coon James was as fat as a barrel, he came down the tree slowly, his fat falling in a roll over his shoulders. The squirrels were working and storing food. They were building leaf nests. The skunks had burrows and plugged themselves in at dawn with bunches of leaves. No drafts could reach them. As I thought of the skunks and all the animals preparing themselves against the winter, I realized suddenly that my tree would be as cold as the air if I did not somehow find a way to heat it. <clears throat> Notes Today I rafted out into the deep pools of the creek to fish. It was a lazy sort of autumn day, the sky clear, the leaves beginning to brighten, the air warm. I stretched out on my back because the fish weren't biting, and hummed. My line jerked and I sat up to pull, but was too late. However, I was not too late to notice that I had drifted into the bank, the very bank where Bando had dug the clay for the jam pots. At that moment I knew what I was going to do. I was going to build a fireplace of clay, even fashion a little chimney of clay. It would be small, but enough to warm the tree during the long winter. Next day, I dragged the clay up the mountain to my tree in my second best pair of city pants. I tied the bottoms of the legs, stuffed them full, and as I looked down onto my strange cargo, I thought of scarecrows and Halloween. I thought of the gang dumping ash cans on Third Avenue and soaping up the windows. Suddenly, I was terribly lonely. The air smelled of leaves, and the cool wind from the stream hugged me. The warblers in the trees above me seemed gay and glad about their trip south. I stopped halfway up the mountain and dropped my head. I was lonely and on the verge of tears. Suddenly, there was a flash, a pricking sensation on my leg. And I looked down in time to see the baron leap from my pants to the cover of the fern. He scared the loneliness right out of me. I ran after him and chased him up the mountain, losing him from time to time in the ferns and crow feet. We stormed into the camp, an awful sight, the baron bouncing and screaming ahead of me, and me dragging that half-scarecrow of clay. 
Frightful took one look and flew to the end of her leash. She doesn't like the Baron, and watches him, well, like a hawk. I don't like to leave her alone. End notes. Must make fireplace. It took three days to get the fireplace worked out so that it didn't smoke me out of the tree like a bee. It was an enormous problem. In the first place, the chimney sagged because the clay was too heavy to hold itself up, so I had to get some dry grasses to work into it so it could hold its own weight. I whittled out one of the old knot holes to let the smoke out and built the chimney down from this. Of course, when the clay dried, it pulled away from the tree, and all the smoke poured back in on me. So I tried sealing the leak with pine pitch, and that worked all right, but then the funnel over the fire bed cracked, and I had to put wooden props under that. The wooden props burned, and I could see that this wasn't going to work either. So I went down the mountain to the side of the old Gribbly farmhouse and looked around for some iron spikes or some sort of metal. I took the wooden shovel that I had carved from the board and dug around what I thought must have been the back door, or possibly the wood house. I found a hinge and old handmade nails that would come in handy. And finally, treasures of treasures, the axle of an old wagon. It was much too big. I had no hacksaw to cut it into smaller pieces, and I was not strong enough to heat it and hammer it apart. Besides, I didn't have anything but a small wooden mallet I had made. I carried my trophies home and sat down before my tree to fix dinner and feed Frightful. The evening was cooling down for a frost. I looked at Frightful's warm feathers. I didn't even have a deer hide for a blanket. I had to use the two I had for a door and a pair of pants. I wished that I might grow feathers. I tossed Frightful off my fist, and she flashed through the trees and out over the meadow. She went with a determination strange to her. She's going to leave, I cried. I've never seen her fly so wildly. I pushed the smoke fish aside and ran to the meadow. I whistled and whistled and whistled until my mouth was dry and no more whistle came. I ran onto the big boulder. I could not see her. Wildly, I waved the lure. I licked my lips and whistled again. The sun was a cold, steely color as it dipped below the mountain. The air was now brisk, and Frightful was gone. I was sure that she had suddenly taken off on the migration. My heart was sore and pounding. I had enough food, I was sure. Frightful was not absolutely necessary for my survival, but I was now so fond of her. She was more than a bird. I knew I must have her back to talk to and play with if I was going to make it through the winter. I whistled. Then I heard a cry in the grasses up near the white birches. In the gathering darkness, I saw movement. I think I flew to the spot, and there she was. She had caught herself a bird. I rolled into the grass beside her and clutched her jesses. She didn't intend to leave, but I was going to make sure that she didn't. I grabbed so swiftly that my hand hit a rock, and I bruised my knuckles. The rock was flat and narrow and long. It was the answer to my fireplace. I picked up Frightful <clears throat> in one hand and the stone in the other, and I laughed at the cold, steely sun as it slipped out of sight, because I knew I was going to be warm. This flat stone was what I needed to hold up the funnel and finish my fireplace. And that's what I did with it. I broke it into two pieces, set one on each side under the funnel, lit the fire, closed the flap of the door, and listened to the wind bring the first frost to the mountain. I was warm. Then I noticed something dreadful. Frightful was sitting on the bedpost, her head under her wings. She was toppling. She jerked her head out of her feathers. Her eyes looked glassy. She's sick, I said. I picked her up and stroked her, and we both might have died there if I had not opened the tent flap to get her some water. The cold night air revived her. Air, I said. The fireplace used up all the oxygen. I've got to ventilate this place. We sat out in the cold for a long time because I was more than a little afraid of what our end might have been. I put out the fire, took the door down, and wrapped up in it. Frightful and I slept with the good frost nipping our faces. Notes I cut out several more knot holes to let air in and out of the tree room. I tried it today. I have Frightful on my fist watching her. She's been about two hours and she hasn't fainted and I haven't gone numb. I can still write and see clearly. Test Frightful's healthy face.